Thank you all so much for being here. My name is Edward Wulcher. I am the curator of lectures at Town Hall Seattle, and I am so honored to uh, welcome you to tonight's program with uh, Holocaust survivor and human rights advocate Irene Butter in conversation tonight with University of Washington professor Richard Block. This program is presented by Town Hall as part of our Arts and Culture series, a series supported by the Wincote Foundation Northwest, the Caffin Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, knock on wood, the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture, and KOW. So a couple quick announcements. Obviously, we're not at Town Hall. We are so grateful to the Finney Neighborhood Center for being one of the spaces that we've been using these last nearly two years while our historic building on First Hill near downtown Seattle has been renovated. If this is one of your first Town Hall events or you've been coming to these while we've been off-site, I'm pleased to announce that Town Hall is going to be reopening very soon, and we hope to invite our community back into the space. But we've been uh, so honored to host authors, speakers, musicians, and activists throughout the year while we've been closed as part of our Inside Out program and so grateful to Finney Neighborhood Center for being one of our hosts. I believe this may be the last time we are here at Finney Neighborhood Center with an author and uh, we are very happy for this very fitting and powerful conclusion to it with Irene Butter tonight. Uh, you can find out information about Town Hall on our website, townhallseattle.org. I will do one quick plug because we have an event just next week in the building with uh, uh, queer Chicana playwright, activist, and feminist, uh, Sherry Moraga, who will be talking about her own memoir and her career in the theater. That's uh, an early opportunity to get to see our building, and there'll be much more coming up uh, in the months to come, so keep an eye out for all of that. Finally, I will say that Town Hall is a member-supported organization. Thank you very much to our members in the room. So uh, about the format tonight, uh, tonight's event will be a conversation between Irene um, and Richard. Uh, that conversation should last about 45 minutes, after which we will have time for Q&A. We have a very full room tonight, so please bear with us. There is a Q&A microphone over here to the right of the stage. If you have a question you're inspired to ask during the presentation, the way to do it is to get up during Q&A and line up along the window here. We'll try to get through as many questions as possible, so please keep your questions brief and in the form of a question. And after all of that, Irene will be um, selling copies of her powerful memoir, Shores Beyond Shores. You can visit me um, at the table in the lobby where we are, uh, have copies for sale, and she'll be signing up here by the stage. Um, lastly, I want to acknowledge and thank the Strom Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Washington, where Professor Richard Block uh, comes to us from. I have some material from the, for the Strom Center on the table there if you're interested in learning more or connected or connecting with the Jewish um, scholarly community here in Seattle, keeping these stories alive. Okay, now what you are here to see tonight. Irene Butter was born in Berlin and grew up as a Jewish child in Nazi-occupied Europe. A survivor of two concentration camps, she came to the United States in 1945. Since the late 1980s, she has taught students about the Holocaust and the lessons she learned during those traumatic years. She's a co-founder of the Raoul Wallenberg Medal and Lecture Series at the University of Michigan, and one of the founders of Zaituna, an Arab-Jewish women's dialogue group in Ann Arbor. Her conversation part partner tonight is Professor Richard Block, an associate professor of Germanics at the University of Washington. His fields of study include Jewish studies, German literature, and 19th and 20th century culture. His work focuses on the ways in which texts construct identity and the ways in which we can place literary, philosophical, and cultural texts in conversation with each other. So we're so happy to have him in conversation with our author tonight, discussing this memoir, Shores Beyond Shores, and, I and Irene's fa fascinating life and powerful legacy as an activist. Please join me in welcoming Irene Butter and Richard Block. Welcome, uh, and welcome, Irene. What a great joy to have somebody um, oh, with your past that you're willing to share with us. And to get things started, I guess I would really want to ask the question that I would want to ask any survivor. How did you do it? How did, it, how did you manage to survive? Well, it's an interesting question, not very easy to answer because basically I don't know except that I had tried to hold on to hope, which isn't easy to do at all times, but um, I also had a dream that kept me going 
When I was a young girl, I read books about Heidi. And Heidi was a little girl who was an, became an orphan, and then she went to live with her grandfather in the mountains of Switzerland, and she did a lot of skiing. And my dream was that I would survive so I could go to Switzerland and learn how to ski. Did you learn no. to ski? <laughs> The thing, the constant um, reminder of just how terrible it must have been is hunger. And you speak a lot about hunger, obviously. Is there any way to describe, I mean, one, the hunger, the weakness, and how people could get through day after day eating nothing but maybe a thin bowl of soup? Well... Frankly, I, I do not think we have words to describe hunger because hunger is such a commonly used word. Uh, I mean, kids come home from school in the afternoon and they say, I'm starved, and they go for the cookie jar. And um, it, it's just not comparable because if you're hungry for a year, you're hungry months after months, the food rations are so minimal, like a piece of bread three inches wide for the whole day, and a bowl of soup in the evening, which is made of turnips boiled in water. And you're, you're never satisfied. You're always hungry, even after the meal. And your stomach is always growling. And uh, for 24 hours a day, you're hungry. It is, it's an endless kind of thing. And I don't really know how to describe it, except uh, I still have anxieties about food. Like if I go on a trip, I have to be sure to have at least a granola bar with me in case there's no food available in a hotel or, or wherever I am. And, and other remnants of behavior are that I never can throw out any leftovers, and I, I can't waste any food. And... Um, Occasionally, I might even consume spoiled food because I can't bear to throw it out. So that's like the lifelong effect of having suffered through hunger and, uh, and not really being able to describe it fully. Are there other lingering effects? I imagine they are. Are there any that are just as pronounced? Yes, I, I'm also crazy in other ways. <laughs> like, we um, should all be so crazy. <laughs> like, um, let's say a tube of toothpaste, I can't throw it out unless I've squeezed out the ultimate last tiny little bit in that tube. And, um, you know, uh, survivors often talk about being members of the, of the plate scrapers club. We can't leave anything on our plates even crumbs, and it's that way with anything, with a piece of soap, you know, I will use it and use it and use it until the ultimate, and there's only one little crumb left that I will be able to throw into the garbage. So I think it's definitely a remnant of a period where there was nothing, nothing available. So how can you waste even the smallest amount of any substance? that is useful. Emotionally, the baggage or the hangover, the aftershock, um, what's so amazing about your book is this light that shines through this very lucid and crisp prose. And even in your eyes, I was saying, you see this light. And I wonder where it comes from and how it inspired the book. But there's something... Um, that I'm sure you had that was able to survive it. I know I don't. And I'm just wondering um, what it might, might be. Do you know what I'm talking about? Well, the, the voice of the child, which I think is, is part of your question, um, that was a very intentional uh, objective because I had read a number of memoirs of Holocaust survivors and usually they write about their childhood because that's when they experienced the Holocaust. But they're now adults and they write in an adult voice. 
And reading those memoirs, it was always my impression that it didn't, what didn't come across is what a child would see, what a child would hear, and what a child would feel under those circumstances. Uh, you know, being innocent and being naive and, and not being very knowledgeable and not really understanding a lot of what was going on. So we, I tried very hard together with my co-writers um, to, to go back to that time and try to remember what it felt like and, and what I heard other people talk about and um, how I would have expressed myself at, at that time. And um, uh, I think we, we managed to do that in, um, in a different way from many, many other memoirs tried to do that. And um, the other part of your question? Now I, oh, I, um, <laughs> afterwards, um, right, there's so many who were unable to endure the post-traumatic aspects of the experience and committed suicide. Did that ever go through your mind? Were you ever life-denying rather than so life-affirming? Frankly, I, I was not because, well, I came out of the concentration camps <clears throat> and spent almost one year in a refugee camp in Algiers, North Africa. And that was a transition. Uh, it, it was definitely not comparable to the concentration camps because we had um, three meals a day, we had real beds, we had sheets, and we got new clothing. We didn't have to wear the rags anymore. And uh, we were located, the camp was located on top of a hill. Going down the hill, we would arrive at a beautiful beach on the Mediterranean Sea. And we had freedom. We could go there anytime we wanted. And I think there was a lot of healing, both from uh, living in a relatively human way and, and being able to, to be in that beautiful sea, sea where I learned how to swim. And so... Of course, it was a very painful period for me because I was separated from my family. I was 14, and I was sent there by myself. So while on the one hand it was very difficult, it also uh, provided some of the basic necessity of life, which I hadn't had for two years, roughly two years. And so when I came, when I arrived in America... Uh, I, th I think I was relatively healthy. I was young. I was 15, turned 15 on the ship. And I was ready for a new life and for new opportunities. And there were many, many wonderful opportunities available uh, for me. And I took advantage of them. And, and I kind of took a leap in, into another life and... Um, you know, while well, life wasn't easy, we were very poor, we were penniless, and uh, my mother was, um, uh, had never really recovered from the trauma of losing her husband, losing her parents, and her sister, and many other relatives, and um, I don't think life ever became happy for her, but for me, uh, it, it was a new start, and... Um, uh, I, th I think that I have, I was able to build a life that was very rich and um, satisfying and positive. So um, I never had any uh, thoughts about suicide. As a matter of fact, I was, I've never been in therapy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to react. <laughs> um... What, was the, what were the sort of friendships like? Or you talk about the people you knew and came across in the camps, and obviously the year in transition in Algeria when your family is not there. Um, were those friendships that lasted? Were they just out of necessity? Was there real warmth? I remember the chapter two where you talk about Anne Frank. Um, could you say something about that? Well, it, it, it was... 
<clears throat> complicated to make friendships in the camps because conditions were so deplorable, we were so congested, there was so little privacy. Uh, but it, it did happen, and um, for example, in Bergen-Belsen, I became a friend with a very close friend of Anna Frank, uh, who um, went to school with her. I, d I had not known her before, but we lived in the same barrack, and um, so, so that was one friendship. It's the only friendship that I made in Bergen-Belsen, but then in Philipville in the refugee camp in, in Africa, there were, um, we didn't have anything to do, and so all the young people hang out together and spend a lot of time together. And then one uh, woman in particular, she was several years younger than I, um, her mother died in Philipville, in, in the camp in Algiers, and so she was then left with her father and her brother, and so um, she and I shared a room for, for quite a while and became very close because my father had just died and her mother had just died and, and we kind of, our closeness was based on grieving. But um, after, the, after we arrived in America, she also lived in New York City and several other friends from the camp lived in New York City. And we saw each other a lot right after um, we, um, we came here. And as, as a matter of fact, I think most of our social life then was with other survivors. And so um, then, you know, after a while, you go in different directions. And uh, I didn't see this friend for several decades. And then we came back together because there were Holocaust survivor meetings every year once the, an organization was formed and we would see each other. And um, we became very close again. Uh, some years ago, she passed away, uh, but I'm very close to two of her daughters. And uh, we see each other from time to time. And they really um, are I interested and um, uh, they, they are, in they, they're very, it's very important to them to uh, be close to me because her mother, their mother didn't speak much about the Holocaust and so they have a lot of questions that I'm able to answer. And so this is true of another friend from the camps who died and I am in touch with his children. So that's one way of having continuity of relationships that um, is gratifying. Thank you. Um, as you mentioned, you know, lots of people I understand, or lots of survivors, chose never to talk about it again. This is just too much. You, of course, have. And was there anything that that you your memoir comes? We could say a little later in your life, and it wasn't something you started right after um, the war. Were the reasons that you decided to pick it up now? and write the memoir? Well, I started talking in the late 80s, but first of all, I want to mention that when I arrived in New York uh, at, in December of 1945, and my cousins, my mother's cousins, picked me up at Grand Central Station, and we took the subway to their apartment, and I still can remember it very clearly. We arrived in their apartment, and the first message the, I got from them is, well, now you're in America, you've finally gotten here, you have to start a new life, forget about the past, and never speak about it. And this is a message that many other survivors report that they got as well, because there wasn't anybody who was willing to listen. It's still kind of a mystery why at that time uh, nobody was willing to listen. And now, uh, fortunately, uh, there's a great interest in hearing from survivors about the Holocaust. So then my mother and my brother arrived and they heard the same thing. And for four decades, we didn't speak about it. Not even my mother and my brother and I spoke about it, except maybe saying something like, I never want to eat turnips again. But that, that was it. 
And so um, in the um, late 1980s, uh, there was an Anna Frank exhibition traveling throughout the country. I came to Detroit and I was invited to speak uh, on a panel about Anna Frank during that exhibition. And when I was um, thinking about what, what I would talk about on the panel, it occurred to me that Anna Frank was not here. Her voice was silenced forever, but I survived. So it's my responsibility to tell the story. And shortly after that, I heard Elie Wiesel, who was a spokesperson for Holocaust survivors and victims. And he said this, he said, if you were in the camps, if you smelled the air, and you heard the silence of the dead, it is your responsibility to become a witness, to provide testimony. For if you do not do that, the dead will die twice. And it made a very deep impression on me that um, being the lucky one and having that gift of life that I needed to be a witness. And so I started talking in schools, late 80s, and um, I never stopped. Thank you. <laughs> we hope you never stop. <laughs> um, by the way, I don't have a watch, so if we hit 45, somebody will let me. Where are we now? We're good. good. Oh, good. Um, one of the things um, that really struck me in the book is your insistence on not stealing from anybody in the camps, your insistence on um, observing the moral code that your parents taught you. And of course you read in so many memoirs, et cetera, Primo Levi talking about how things he did in the camps brought a sense of guilt because he couldn't observe his moral code. And I think it's so wonderful when we read your memoir to know that survival was possible, and yet you never felt that you had to compromise that. How was it possible? I mean, how well, I questioned it myself in, in, in my book, especially when I saw the health of my parents deteriorate day by day. And uh, of course, my parents were the role models and, and they emphasized all along that you never take anything away from a person who is in the same situation as you are. And, uh, and I questioned that. So is it really worthwhile to maintain that morality and that integrity and then lose my parents? And uh, that was a very difficult issue. I remember just before we were liberated from Bergen-Belsen because we became part of a prisoner exchange, we received um, two packages from Sweden. And this had never happened before. The whole year we were in Bergen-Belsen. And then my father said, we, we're leaving this, these packages here for, for friends who have to stay behind. And I, I said to my dad, I said, but we don't know that we're going to get any food because the Nazis, they lied all the time. They, whatever they promised uh, did not come through. And I was a little worried that here we were leaving the camp, going away on a train and not knowing where the next piece of bread would come from. But he insisted on leaving that food. And um, uh, I, I remember that for the rest of my life now. The fact that I survived anyway is, is luck. But um, I, th I think integrity in hard times, in situations that are very challenging, it, it's harder to maintain that than to give in and, and try to meet your needs. Do you fault anybody who did? I, I think it's hard to fault someone who steals to feed her children or, or to feed her sick husband. Uh, but, you know, there is a moral code and people who were thieves in Bergen-Belsen, there, there were some judges and they did punish people for stealing from others. Okay. Um, 
When you arrived, well, when you first went, the, the, some of the more harrowing passages, right, are about the transport and the recognition that this was not a passenger car, but these were cattle cars. How did people, what was that experience like? I mean, what do you remember from it? How did people, it just seems that you would open the door and there would just be nothing but dead bodies falling out, and particularly from the longer trips. What can you say about that? Well, I, my family was not in a cattle car for more than eight hours, and it was gruesome, even for that length of time, because they loaded 50, 60, 70 people into the cattle car, and sometimes there wasn't enough room for everybody to sit down. You had to sit on the lap of somebody else. And it, um, p the people responded so differently. I mean, some people were crying, some people were moaning and groaning, some people were cursing, and some people tried to sing a song. So um, it depends, people react to situations like that very differently, but it's, um, it's a, a gruesome experience, and it's definitely one that um, uh, I remember every time I see a freight train. Uh, the memory comes back of being squeezed into that kind of a car. There was no so bathroom even, no? I mean, what did people do to relieve themselves? Uh, there, there was a bucket, but it That's didn't. Right. Who would hold the blanket. So, right, right. Uh, well, um, the issue of, um, of survival in the camps, um, do, uh, I'm going to lost with the last, oh. I wanted to mention too, um, when you then got off of the, ca uh, the cattle car, and the doors were, but what was the first impression and what did you hear and how did you negotiate all that screaming and yelling and brutality? Well, when, when we arrived in Vesterborg, the first camp, first of all, it was dark and there weren't any lights because during war you have to, you know, protect yourself because the bombers are flying over. So it was very dark and then we were led into a building and it was for for me at that age I was 12 I wasn't even 12 years old yet and we uh, they separated men and women and we all had to undress and so there was this room full of naked women and I had never seen a naked body before in my life and uh, they were examining everybody for lice uh, if you had lice on your hair lies, then they shaved all your hair off. So it, it was really an awful experience landing there uh, in the beginning and, and getting registered and assigned to barracks. But next morning, you know, we had, we lived in, we were assigned to three tiered steel framed bunk beds and it only had a straw mattress, no blankets, no pillows, no anything like that. And uh, the next morning you wake up and you have to adapt yourself to that way of living. There, there is no choice. But of course, the contrast between leaving home one day and waking up in a barrack the next day is, is a big shock. How did your parents help to couch the pain or and the shame and the idea that you know we don't know what tomorrow is we as you said uh your mother i think it was said that every day in the concentration camp is a question mark so how did they steal you or prepare you each day to get through they really weren't able to do that because they had to get used to it themselves i remember one day when we arrived in bergen belsen the day that we were met by the um uh, SS, and they had big uh, German shepherds, and the, the dogs were barking, and I was very scared, and my mother said to me, well, dogs that bark don't bite, but I didn't believe her. <laughs> 
nor do any, nor does any person with a brain, probably. <laughs> did you ever think of escaping? No, we did not, because <coughs> Bergen-Belsen was surrounded by a barbed wire fence. And of course, there were these watch posts, and soldiers were in these posts all the time. And um, sometimes there were uh, wired fences that were electrified. So if you heard about that, you weren't going to go near one of those fences. And in, in uh, Bergen-Belsen, uh, you didn't have a chance to escape because there were eight camps, seven other camps besides ours, and you wouldn't even know what direction to walk in, and then you wouldn't get very far just to another camp. And so um, I know some people escaped from Auschwitz. I don't know how they did it, but there were some people who escaped and survived. But it was very rare. And some people tried to escape, and they got shot by a guard. And then there are those, right, who did escape only to find from, like, in Auschwitz, the Poles were all too eager to turn them back in. Right. Um, so, so it's almost like no escape. No, it, it, it is. Um, um, what is the one thing, perhaps, I mean, it's a silly, trite question to ask, but the one, it, it needs to be asked. What's the one thing and the message you always want people to take away from this? Well, I, when I talk in schools, I, and I often get the question, do you think the Holocaust can happen again here in this country? And uh, I, I tell them I think it could. And one reason why Hitler was so successful because, you know, there were perpetrators, and there were victims, and there were bystanders. And many people in Germany did not believe in, in the Hitler ideology of white supremacy and um, uh, evil Jews and all that, that we have to eradicate Jews from the planet. Yet, they didn't do anything about it. Now, it was risky, sure. Uh, you could be punished. You might be shot. But still, at a certain point, uh, one cannot be passive, silent, inactive when injustice, when evil is being committed. So my message usually is never be a bystander when you see things that are evil, unjust, um, mean. We can't just turn our backs, and it, it goes to different levels, of course. Kids experience bullying in schools, and uh, you should uh, confront the bullier, uh, and you can get help. Or you could, if you confront the bullier, maybe other people will also do that. Uh, we can't just close our eyes, and then, of course, there are higher-level acts and and uh, more crucial conditions. And right now, in our country, where we see some echoes of the Holocaust, it's extremely important that we are not bystanders. Uh, we have all kinds of options. We can vote our values. We can protest. We can sign petitions. We can go on marches. Uh, there are all kinds of other actions. We can build sanctuary cities. And uh, I think one of the worst acts we see right now is the separation of families to separate children from their parents at uh, various ages. Some are put in cages, others are put in tents. There's no record of where the parents are, where the children are, how to uh, reunify them. Uh, it, it is horrible that 75 years after the Holocaust, these practices are repeated, even in our own country, which is probably the greatest democracy in the world. So we have to protect our democratic values. Uh, we have rights. We have opportunities. And um, passiveness is just not acceptable in these days. If, if we want to work for a better world and if we want to be active in assuring that a Holocaust will not be repeated, at least not in our own country. Yeah. 
I think, you know, that's such a powerful note for us to conclude here and open it up for questions. But there was one thing I wanted to do because um, when I'm unable to communicate in a conversation is just how powerful and important Irene's voice is. And there's a, two paragraphs where she writes about hunger. And I just would like to read those so that you get a taste of her prose. Hunger was the ache in every moment. Sleep was our lone escape. I awoke from the same dream, born of constant craving. I was the pet dog of a wealthy family. The family enjoyed huge dinners heaped on silver platters. There was lamb or beef, different types of vegetables, fruit and bread and pies and ice cream galore. I sat patiently under the table, alert and waiting. At the end of the meal, they scraped the leftovers onto a plate and lowered it down. I wagged my tail and gulped down everything at once, slobbering everywhere. Darkness became cover for what became known as bread thieves, whose numbers were growing. The clothing thieves you could watch out for, but the bread thieves struck at night. Back in Amsterdam and Berlin, we had more than we knew, cradled in comfort and with enough food to fill the bellies of all of our visiting family or anybody who visited. We would have been so mad had a thief broken into our home and stolen our civil, silver, sorry. but all we really would have lost was an heirloom, a family memory, and a pinch of pride. Now the stakes were higher and for so much less. Thank you, Irene. I know we all are so happy you survived. Thank so you. can we open it to questions? And there's a microphone for people to use. Don't be shy. Oh, I'll, I'll go first. You want to use it? Okay. Yes, go. And you can line up if it will save time. Hello, Irene. I'm Lucy Bauer, and I'm also a survivor. And, but I was a lot younger than you were. The thing is, I want to ask you, is I still, I, I'll be 79, I still have memories. And I would call it cemented in my head that I cannot change the story. D do you have that in your head? Do you, do you see what I'm saying? It's just like I'm watching a slideshow or if I talk about my experiences, it's always the same experience. There's nothing added and there's nothing taken away. It's always the same. And I actually see it in black and white. Do you have that experience? I I don't think so. I think Lucky. I think I have that experience in my mind, but then many other experiences right. that have yeah. come after. Okay, thank you. And what about your health? Do you have any um, issues? Did you have any issues after you were released, or uh, you know, health-wise? Because I I had turbicle TB, and I had rickets and all that stuff. So did mm -hmm. you? No, I didn't have um, health problems. I think I grew healthy and uh, well-nourished pretty quickly. Okay. I remember a letter I wrote from the refugee camp in Algiers that I, I think I have to go on a diet. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. But, um, but I'm wondering now that I'm older, uh, and for example, I have lost a lot of height now, we all lose height later on in life, but I think my loss has been uh, a little bit extreme. I've lost eight inches wow. of height. See, I and I wonder if that is connected to malnutrition at a certain earlier it, point. Yes, because I have, I was five foot seven, and now I'm, I was surprised. I'm now five foot two. So where did that all go? 
you, you know, we yeah. Can't, we can't grow it back. That's no, that's, that's true. But you can, you know, you can stand up straighter and pretend you're still five foot seven, right? <laughs> Thank you. You know, I really appreciate you. I would have, I, I, I'm a volunteer at Town Hall. I probably wouldn't have come here because I, it just brings up memories that, like you say, you don't talk about. But I'm glad I came. Well, thank you very much thank for you. coming. Someone making his way to the front. Hi, my name is Ed Rankin. Thank you so much. You may have just answered this question, but I want to ask it maybe a little differently. There's a wave of populism that's sweeping the, the world, and we have Trump here, and there's kind of a debate about whether or not it's okay to compare Trump to Hitler. And some people say absolutely not because Hitler was evil and there were concentration camps and you know, the worst of the worst, and other people say, well, there's a real similarity. And I'm wondering what you think about that. Well, I think when you make a comparison, it doesn't mean that they're identical. And they're not, obviously, they're not. But um, Trump's behaviors show a movement towards being a dictator, being authoritarian, um, taking away people's rights, um, compromising our democratic institutions, which take away our freedom. So there are definitely characteristics, and he's not the only person like that ruling a country in the world. I think there's Netanyahu, there's Erdogan in Turkey, there's Putin in Russia. And, and if they all join hands and cooperate with each other and support each other, then our world is going to change, is going to go downhill. So I, I understand the comparison. It doesn't mean they're identical. Thank you. Please. Hi, Irene. Um, I'm Chelsea Rudd. Thanks for being here. My question is, when you were in the camps, um, did, you, did you and the folks around you know the full extent of what was happening? Like, did you know that there were people being executed in the gas chambers and, and such? Yes, um, we did because a train came every week to Vesterborg, a cattle car train, and uh, this was the train that took most people from the Netherlands to Auschwitz. 120,000 Jews from the Netherlands were transported in cattle cars from Westerbork to either Auschwitz or some, some other death camp. And then when the train came back, there were notes that were stuck somewhere in the corner and the ceiling, which uh, people in Westerbork had to clean the trains, the wagons of the train. And they found these notes. And so these notes talked about the gas chambers and what is happening in Auschwitz. So it was not a secret what would happen to you if you, if you happened to be on the list that had to board that train. Thank you. Please come up. Just come up. Hi, Irene. My name is Allison. <laughs> that didn't work. Um, and my question is about language. Um, obviously, you seem like a quite fluent English speaker. I'm going to assume that English isn't your first language growing up in Europe. Um, could you tell us uh, your language history? Did you speak Yiddish? Did you speak German? and how you learned languages, how many languages you speak, just the whole, the whole system there. 
Sure. Well, I was born in Germany, so that's my first language that I learned. And then um, we went to Holland, and um, I, my brother and I learned Dutch very quickly because we were pretty young. And, of course, we wanted to... Um, we went to school right away and wanted to communicate with people. So that wasn't a problem. But then when the Nazis invaded Holland... Uh, I began to hate the language, the German language, and I wouldn't speak it anymore, and I only spoke Dutch. And then in, um, there was Bergen-Belsen, so the dominant language there was German. So if I had needed to understand something, uh, but I would not speak it if I could avoid it. And in um, Algiers, it's a French-speaking country, so I learned some French but I didn't really continue to use the language coming to America. Uh, so I know very little French, and I um, had very limited knowledge of English when I arrived in America, but I went to school right away and um, learned it pretty quickly. I had to, I was in high school. And um, I did not speak German for, for decades. And if I heard people speak German, I just walked away from it. Even though my family, um, you know, my mother, who that was her first language, she used it. And as she got older, she used it more and more. But then uh, about five years ago, I, I was invited to Heidelberg in Germany to participate in a symposium. And... Um, I went to the town where my father is buried, a small town in southern Germany, and I'd been there a number of times, so I'd made friends, and they invited me to speak to the high schools, two high schools in that town. And just before my talk, they said, could you please give your talk in German? <laughs> and I said, no, I can't, because uh, it hasn't been my language for many decades. And they said, please, um, insert a few words because our students are not so strong in English. And then when it came to giving my talk, I gave unintentionally, I gave the whole talk in German. And uh, I had little help, a few words were missing in my vocabulary. But uh, I came full circle because that experience then um, made me aware that I, I could use the language again. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much. My name is Laura. Um, my question is about your religion and practice of Judaism and how that went for you as you came to the United States. Were you able to continue practicing? How did that? Well, um, my family w was not... Um, observant. Okay. And we did celebrate holidays and with family, with relatives and so on. My brother and I were in, sent to religious school at a young age, but then when the war came, that was banned, so we didn't have much of a religious education. My brother was bar mitzvah, although there were certain rules by the Nazis that couldn't have more than 20 people or something like that, mm -hmm. but he did. And then uh, then we went to the camps, and uh, my brother always said, for me, God died in Bergen-Belsen. Oh. And he never really um, resumed the practice of religion. And uh, my father was the more religious, more observant one, my mother less so. So when we came to America, uh, we did not join a, sy a synagogue. Um, for many years, but later on, um, when I had my own family, my husband and I joined, and um, our children went to religious school, but with two careers and uh, raising a family and taking care of elderly parents, uh, it somehow we didn't manage the time to, to be very observant. And uh, the past 15 years, I have... Um, uh, belong to a congregation. Uh, my Hebrew is not strong. I mean, it's barely <laughs> existent. And <laughs> my, my main, okay. <laughs> uh, satisfaction 
uh, belonging to the temple is to be part of the Jewish community mm -hmm. and because I have opportunities to work for social justice in that context and, um, and, and so that is my reason for belonging. Thank you for letting me ask you that question. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Irene, you, not too many years ago, spoke to a class I taught at Eastern Michigan University. I remember. <clears throat> <laughs> it was a very, very <clears throat> memorable e evening for those, those students. But I, uh, I wish to ask you if you would share some thoughts and describe the, the Zaituna group a bit for us. Sure. Be glad to do that. Zaytuna is a group I co-founded in Ann Arbor, Michigan, consisting of six Palestinian women and six Jewish women who um, practice dialogue in our homes every other week. And we have existed for 16 years. We have dialogues about complicated issues, but the first year after we started our group, we didn't talk about any conflict, any political issues. We only listened to each other's narratives. And uh, that was a, a very important decision because it created trust and safety within the group and then we were able to handle um, the, the conflicts and the, and the di difficult subjects. We are now 16 or 17 years old and, and have been meeting every other week in each other's homes. We are invited to classes on campus and to churches and synagogues and to model that it's possible to have a group like that to address conflict and to learn from each other, learn a great deal. And it, we're very bonded at this point, and when there are difficult situations, political situations, we often find that the only place where we can really deal with it in depth is Zaytuna, because the Palestinian women find it difficult to talk to, to their community, and Jews find it difficult to, to have the same views in their own community, but we try and I think there, there is more tolerance and more openness in the Jewish community now to face what's going on in the Middle East. Great. Our motto is refusing to be enemies. Hello, Irene. Um, so I had a question about the so it, when you were in the concentration camps, or did you hear news about like the war effort that was going on, and how did that like affect how you held on to hope? Well, we we didn't have any newspapers, and so there's very no radio. There's very little news. Once in a while, one of the Nazis would contribute a piece of information, but especially when Germany started losing the war, they were not uh, happy with that and they didn't share anything with us. And so we really were ignorant about what was happening. And of course, the invasion started in Normandy, it took a long, long time, more than a year and a half to reach other parts of Europe uh, for liberation. So um, there wasn't much hope, there wasn't good news available. And it's, you know, I always say when in, to kids, school kids, you know, they're waiting for summer. There's a, there's a certain date when the school year will end, but we had no date when the war will end. And I think that makes hope a lot less accessible when you just don't know. You live from day to day, but you don't know the end. Thank you. Well, one last question and then I would like to ask you. Um, jean Marie, when he wrote about torture in the camps, he talks once he's been tortured, it's impossible to regain trust in the world. 
How did you regain trust in the world? Well, certain kind of trust I don't have. I never leave my pocketbook anywhere. <laughs> and, you know, I, I just keep treasures very close to me. And um, information that is, um, is to be private, I, I don't share with anybody because you can't really trust anybody to not pass it on, even if they promise. Uh, so a certain kind of trust I don't think I've ever developed. Well, there's words can never express one's feelings of gratitude and for sharing your story and helping us all gain some insight into something we hope never happens again, but is always too prevalent a threat for us to forget and not be vigilant. But once again, thank you, and thank you for your work. I want to thank you very, very much for sharing this conversation that um, made it more fluent and uh, more long-ranging and widespread. And, and I, I appreciate your coming for this. Oh, my pleasure, please. Thank you.